Hi everyone and welcome to your masterclass on transformation from shy to confident leader. Um, now for today, all the content are my own original ideas, thoughts um, based on my personal experience. So anytime I mention a book, a video or a quote, I'll include a source or a reference. So I'll provide you with a, in today's class, I'll provide you with a bit of a background as your instructor. I'm also loving all the emojis, by the way. Um, I'll go through the three main keywords in the talk topic, which is shy, confident, and transformation. I'll go through uh, my important um, turning point in my confidence journey. The three main key areas in my transformation, which is mindset, training, preparation, action, and we'll end with a 10-minute Q&A in an Ask Me Anything format. So let's begin. So for those of you who are meeting me for the first time, hi, I'm Amy Asais. I'm a proud mum, Filipino-Australian. I'm currently a senior product designer, and in previous roles I've been a product design lead. I have been an ADP list mentor for 12 months, but I have been mentoring for more than 20 years. I'm an ambivert, so I'm a bit of a mix of both introvert and extrovert. I'm passionate mental health advocate, as well as fitness and karate, so much that I am a blue belt, that's halfway to black belt, and I'm proud to say I'm 44 years old. Now, in terms of our topic today, let's go through what it means to be shy. So shy is when you're feeling nervous or timid in the company of other people. And to be confident is feeling or showing certainty about something. So in a way, you could say, in an opposite way, shy is feeling uncertainty. So let's do a quick poll before we explore my um, journey. Um, a bit more. True or false? I was mute when I was younger. Has everyone voted? Okay, how much longer on the poll, Utkash? All done? Yep. And the answer is true. I was mute till I was three years old. So in terms of speaking, yes, speaking was very challenging for me. Um, I was labelled as shy when I was younger. My opinions were dismissed. I was treated like I was invisible. Um, and I got used to this behavior so much that I felt comfortable um, in the shadows. So you could say everything was not fine at all. It was not a great way to live. Compared to how I am now, I speak confidently with CEOs. I don't listen to negative um, opinions or labels put upon me because I define who I am. I am persuasive and I use my influential powers for good. I choose to be visible to inspire other shy people that it is possible to evolve, and I choose to live outside my comfort zone. And when I realized I needed an internal shift that brought me in alignment with my highest potential, that was the very definition of transformation. And that turning point was the UX Australia conference in 2018, so not very long ago. And when Lauren Curry, who was the keynote speaker, presented a talk about redefining power, it absolutely changed my life because she said confidence, actually power ties in directly to confidence and certainty. So she said, you know, to be a leader, you don't need to be a white man shouting at a podium um you can be 
you know, when I understood, because my perception of confident leader was you had to be loud and aggressive and quite extroverted. So I never thought I could be a leader. But when I understood that you could be a kind and a compassionate leader and also introverted, it absolutely changed my mindset. And that's when I decided that my confidence journey starts now. So this is how I transformed. Um, I went through various phases, but these are the main three. I went through mindset training, preparation, and all importantly, action. So in mindset training, I decided to connect with mentors. So being a mentor myself, it's important to connect with other mentors, absorb positive content, and live daily affirmations. So when I connected with mentors, I actually reached out to leaders who inspired me because I wanted to learn about their leadership path to give me ideas about my path that I wasn't sure about. And then through this experience, I learned that when you surround yourself with outstanding people, you become outstanding. And these are some of the outstanding mentors that I chose to surround myself with. So there's my mum and dad. Um, so, you know, their day job was, um, you know, a telephonist. My mum, she had an amazing voice. And my dad, who is a computer engineer. They were radio DJs in the Philippines. Um, they were MCs for charities and beauty pageants. They are activists and they have won awards for their humanitarian effort. And as I mentioned, Laura Curry. She's an OBE, Order of the British Empire, CEO and founder of Upfront, which is a confidence program that she created. She's an activist and mother. And Emma Jones, who I'll mention um, later on in the talk, she is a CEO and founder of Project F, which is the first mentoring program I ever joined. She's an activist and amazingly, she's a grandmother. So you can see a bit of a link between all of these three. I chose mentors that resonate with me because I myself am a parent. Um, and I just think it's amazing when I see other parents still achieving their big dreams. Okay, the next step is to absorb positive content. So we need to realize that who we surround ourselves with as well as the content that we absorb daily affects our mindset and behavior. So, you know, whatever format you like, whether it's YouTube, podcasts, audiobooks, or even a paper book, um, these are just a few um, people who inspire me with um, their famous quotes because I chose them because they have powerful voices and mindsets that resonate with who I aspire to be and will become. And here are examples of some of their quotes and why I find them inspiring. So Simon Sinek, when he says leadership isn't about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in your charge. That teaches me to be a kind leader and that's how I aspire to be. When Oprah says everything always works out for me, what with that positive information, what it does is in an opposite way, when you say things like nothing ever works out for me, what your brain does, it, it looks to actively seek to prove yourself right. So when you tell yourself positive affirmations, similar to having a great um, grateful mindset, grateful attitude, you seek to prove yourself right. So it actually changes the way your brain thinks. And with Rocco Balboa, yep, he is a movie character, but I love this quote anyway. Um, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. So I use this not only in fitness, but in mental health. Um, it reminds me to be mentally resilient. So live daily affirmations, what does that mean? So what I noticed about studying leaders is they, have, they usually have some sort of morning ritual. So a lot of them are part of the 5 a.m. club which I am not, I like to sleep in. Um, so they, you know, might exercise at 5 a.m. I will have, you know, a five minute meditation and I will say, you know, a positive affirmation to myself, which sets the tone so I can focus my mindset and my energy for that day. And here's an example. 
So even today, um, the affirmation I chose was today I'm changing my life for the better. So just experiencing this masterclass and being able to share my skills, experience and knowledge with you all, I'm changing my life for the better and I'm hopefully changing at least one life for the better who's able to learn at least one thing today. Um, the second affirmation, I like to use that for a Monday morning where I just tell myself I'm able to deal with any challenge this day brings. It's a Monday. Um, and then, you know, if I go to an event by myself, if I feel, you know, kind of socially nervous, I'll use the third affirmation to say I'm welcomed with arms wide open anywhere I go. Okay, the second stage is preparation. So um, preparation, we need to set big goals, create big habits and commit to start today. And what does that look like? So for us to transform, that is a pretty big deal. So we need to set big goals for yourself, big and scary. So set the biggest goal you can think of and then chunk it down into small steps. Okay, before I share my big scary goal, um, we'll have another poll. Udkash, if you can put up the other poll. Okay, true or false, I have a fear of public speaking. Okay, looks like the poll is done. The answer is true. So my big scary goal uh, where, that I chose at the beginning of my confidence journey, I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I chose to be ambitious and my goal was I will be a TEDx speaker. And for me to achieve that goal, I chunked it down into small steps and these are the small brave things I did over 2019 and 2020 to take me one step closer to my big scary goal of being a TEDx speaker. So I did my first speed mentoring session. This is pretty scary meeting new people. Um, I did a meet and greet with General Assembly students. Um, I did a first my first UX talk in front of 200 people. That was pretty scary. And then also put my hand up to be um, a guest on a podcast. And then COVID hit, we love COVID. Um, during COVID, I offered UX grads career advice where I did about 20 Zoom sessions over two weeks. And I, you know, was getting used to the idea, building my confidence, ignoring my imposter syndrome. I finally felt like I was a mentor and I signed up with Project F. So that was all over two years. And here's examples of me being brave, meeting new people, previously shy and just really getting out there and choosing to be visible. Okay, the next step is to create new habits. So many of you might have heard of um, the 2190 rule. So based on the 2190 rule where it takes 21 days to create a new habit and 90 days to make it part of your lifestyle, I actually formed my own rules to create a new habit. So how I created new habits was, I'll use fitness as an example, you set one easy goal to complete in one week. So for example, I want to walk 10 minutes for one week. You then complete that very easy task over four weeks. You build on your new habit from week five to eight. So, you know, the first four weeks was 10 minutes. The next five to eight was 20 minutes. You then track your progress from, you know, for months three, six, and 12. And when you track your progress over time and keep building on it, that's how you develop a growth mindset. And the reason why I chose to pick an easy goal is because when you 
choose a massive goal like this is fitness, you say I'm going to run a half marathon, it seems too hard, too big, and no one ever starts. If you tell yourself I'm going to walk 10 minutes, that's pretty easy. But the thing, the main thing is to start. So that's why you need to start with one easy goal that there is no way you can fail and the whole point is to start. Thanks for all the reactions, by the way. And, of course, commit to start today. So no save the dates. No, I'll start on Monday. No, oh, I'll start tomorrow. Start today. Well, obviously not during this session, um, but maybe after this session, you might commit to doing one small thing. Maybe, oh, I'm going to book a mentor session with Felix. I'm going to reach out to Ermi on LinkedIn. Whatever your confidence journey looks like, commit to starting today and do one small easy thing. And the third exciting stage is action. So in terms of being a confident leader, you need the tools. And those tools are to be a strong communicator, you need to practice speech and body language. You then need to put that into practice by speaking up in groups and then lead some sort of group or project. So when Amy Cuddy, a social psychologist and TEDx speaker, did her talk about your body language may shape who you are that also changed my life because I didn't even realize that my body language and my tone of voice was actually sending negative messages so I didn't realize that you know sitting like this or having a soft tone of voice or not using eye contact or talking you know constantly with my arms crossed was sending all these negative messages so once I started to learn about body language, I started to change from the inside out. <clears throat> so when you practice speech and body language, so these are actually tips that my parents gave me. Um, and I know just, you know, being previously a shy person, um, some of the fear comes from being self-conscious. So I so to be able to talk in front of the mirror and just stare at yourself is pretty confronting. But, you know, if your fear is, you know, how do I look, you need to confront that by looking at yourself in the mirror, check your body language, your mannerisms, and then go one step further and record yourself. So you can play it back, look at your mannerisms, look at, you know, your lack of eye contact, is your voice monotone? Do you constantly talk where your voice goes up? So it sounds like you're asking a question and it makes you sound uncertain. So the goal is to improve your body language so you can look and sound confident and then eventually become confident. And then the next thing, so speaking up in meetings or groups. So it doesn't have to be work-related. It could be I'm going to post a question in, you know, this session or the next session if, you know, you're usually too shy to do that. Or if there's a next in-person meetup, you might raise your hand and commit to asking a question in real life. Um, if it's a work meeting, you might, uh, where if you're a junior, you might, you know, feel like your opinion doesn't matter. So you might just reiterate an important point to say, yep, Udkash, that was a really great point. You know, I can see where you're going from here. And then you might follow on with your own comment. So these are just small tips on how you can just start to speak up where you don't need to do a long speech. You might just make one comment. And then it's time to lead a group or project or whatever community or exciting activity you have in mind that includes leadership. It's not just related to work. So, but for this example, it is work-related. You might ask to shadow your leader or co-facilitate a workshop or co-lead a project. And then you may commit to lead the next one with your leader's guidance and then commit to leading the next one on your own. But if you're a hands-on learner, you might just want to jump straight into the deep end and just lead on your own, make mistakes, and then get your leader to give you feedback, whatever you feel comfortable with, 
Whereas this, these three steps, these are the steps that I felt comfortable with. And then through time, I just lead on my own. And then I just test and fail and see how I go. And here are examples of me leading. So yes, there's evidence. Um, top right, I was a moderator for the first time. So that was pretty scary, but very exciting. No one believed. Um, I had a fear of public speaking, um, but I got a lot of coaching from my parents for that. Very proud with all of my ADP list mentoring activities. Confidence also applies to fitness and other activities and other areas of your life. Had I not been confident um, in myself, I wouldn't have done, you know, a Spartan course with 30 obstacles running 16 kilometers or done the city to surf um, and reached a personal best just this year. So these are just a few examples of my confidence journey. And here are a few references that I may have mentioned. Um, if anyone, you know, wants to get some inspiration, some TEDx talks on Netflix, I recently watched The Playbook, really great for mindset coaching, uh, mindset training, particularly Doc Brown, the NBA coach. He's amazing. And in terms of habit performing, which is pretty difficult because we often break our habits, um, you might want to read The Compound Effect, which is what sparked my idea in creating my habit forming rule, where you start with one small goal and then you compound that over several years. So what have we learned? in today's masterclass. So we've learned that you need to shift your mindset so it's open to change. You need to develop the skills to prepare to be a confident leader. And in terms of action, you need to start today to lead a life as a confident leader. And I know it may seem like a lot, whether you're really shy or whether you know, you're developing confidence, you feel like you're halfway there, but always remember, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you very much. So if anyone wants to connect with me, I suggest um, LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me there. Thank you for all the love and emojis. I really love it. And it should be time, Utkash, is it time for Q&A? Okay, great question. How to stay confident when we get rejections from everywhere in the work we love? Um, that's a really difficult one. How do we stay confident? I need to think about this one from everywhere in the work we love. I would say do something you love outside of work or remind yourself. It depends. If this is specific to when it comes to rejections, if you're saying um, you're not landing the job, for example, um, I would say, this is a really difficult question. How do you stay confident? I remind myself to be persistent. That's what I do. Um, similar to my affirmation that everything always works out for me. When I transitioned from graphic designer to product designer, I was already 38 years old and um, recruiters were telling me, you're not going to get a job. Um, because I, you know, it was probably a little bit ageist, but in my mind, I told myself, yes, I will. I always win. And I was just persistent or I found other ways that weren't um, the natural or predictable path. So if the predictable path is just apply for a job, see how you go, apply for a job, see how you go. Um, sometimes I would go, maybe I can have some sort of transition job. So my first job was digital designer slash UX. So it wasn't a pure UX role that I kept getting rejections from because at the time I didn't have enough research experience. So that's why I kept getting rejected. And so I was persistent. I went, okay, 
if I keep getting rejections in terms of research, I need to fill that skills gap. So maybe I can, you know, do this hybrid role, UX slash digital. And I actually did a free UX research course with IXDA where I got mentored and upskilled in research. And then after I left that job, I was able to land a product design role that included research. So just keeping persistent in those rejections, listen to the feedback and really take it on. Try to stay humble because there's probably a reason why you're getting rejected. Listen to that feedback so that you can become successful. Okay, next question. Sorry, that was a long one. <laughs> um, okay, aside from being shy, would you have any advice when it comes to being lost for words and on the spot? Um, it comes to practice, practicing how to talk. So in that example where I said practice talking um, in front of the mirror or talk for one minute, uh, when I first did that, I actually stumbled a lot. I couldn't talk for 10 seconds. So it actually takes practice. The same way you develop a skill. Um, if you met me, you know, 20 years ago, I would not look like the same person. I didn't know how to talk. But the more I do these talks, masterclass, webinar, panelist, portfolio reviews with IXDA, I actually practice talking on the spot. So I'm able to start to fill in gaps and pauses when I used to be uncertain 20 years ago. So, yeah, similar to, you know, pitching in baseball. If you do that 100 times a day, you'll be phenomenal over a period of time. So it just takes practice. Okay, next question. How can you recover after coming out of a toxic work environment? Oh, this is very relevant to me because that actually happened to me. No, um, actually, I've actually had a, this talk is quite personal because um, this actually makes me more resilient. And for me, career is career my career is part of my life it's not always you know a upward trajectory sometimes I go down so you know I'm just completely transparent this talk is about my life if you look at my LinkedIn profile previously previous roles I was a product design lead and then my title you know went slightly down to senior product designer because I felt like I needed a break from being a product design lead um because you know in previous roles you know, there were, you know, some quite challenging circumstances. So sometimes you need to take a break. Remember that your career has no expiration. It's okay to take a step down. Sometimes if you can afford it, have one month break, one month off. Um, so, yeah, like really, really look after yourself, your mental health. Go back to things that you love. Uh, if it was a toxic work environment, maybe take a break from work if you can afford it. If, you know, you can't afford to take a break from work, um, try to really focus on the things that you love so that you're making yourself happy and you're looking after your mental health. Next question. How to build self-confidence and trust and work. This is quite tricky because there's a few dependencies. So if you don't have psychological safety with your leader, that's quite difficult because there probably isn't a lot of trust there. But what you can do is you can build networks with other leaders that you do trust. So, for example, if your leader, you didn't feel like you could trust them, if there are other peers on their level that you did trust, you can then build self-confidence. So there's always a solution. It's never, you know, you don't need to put all your eggs in one basket and I need to have trust in my one boss. If I don't have that, I have nothing. No, you can have trust in other leaders or even your peers or other departments or teams and then you build that confidence um, and trust around you. Next question. How can a younger leader build the confidence to lead large and varied teams with a mix of older and younger folks? Okay. Um, so in the beginning of my talk, I mentioned my age. 
And I did that because I feel like age is not a barrier um, unless you make it a barrier. And even though I'm a little bit older, ironically, sometimes when people meet me, they think I'm in my 20s or early 30s, so they treat me like I'm junior. And then when they realise I have 20 years' experience, they actually treat me with more respect, which is quite weird. Um but I think it depends on how you present yourself, whether you're, you know, a young gun and you're 22 and you're leading a large, you know, and varied teams, you're killing it. Like that just proves you deserve to be there. Try not to think about you're leading older people. You deserve that role, that title, that position. Try not to think about age. I know it's hard not to think about the imposter syndrome or oh, they're older than me. But maybe have a think about why you're leading them, regardless of their age. You have the skills and ability to lead them, regardless of their age. Just try to just um, remind yourself of that. It's not about age. Next question. How to avoid negative stress of being shy? Um, this is a process for me. So I know my friend Sarah is in the talk. I have a process where every time I talk, I get really stressed. So I just breathe. Um, I can't avoid it. It's just part of my process. I kind of get really stressed and then I come to a state right before I join my talk and then I'm really calm. I'm really excited and I breathe and I just let go. So similar to, hey, Sarah, um, similar to uh, meditation, I think a lot of mindset training comes into that because, and also those affirmations. So if you're going through that negative stress, it's probably um, the negative things that you're telling yourself, oh, my God, I can't do this. Oh, something might go wrong. I might stuff up. What if, you know, I freak out or something? But then when you just let go and just breathe, um, it does help with your calm state of mind and you can think and speak clearer. Hopefully that answered the question. Have you ever felt you're being a bad leader for your current team? How do you overcome that? Uh, well, in my current team, I'm actually one of the co-leaders, so I don't have people actually reporting to me. In previous roles, I am lucky and I don't know if I should say lucky because I am pretty proud that in my experience, I've led two small teams. Um, one, I led, I think, four designers. One, I only had one report. And because I was a designer, still very hands-on and I very firmly believe in psychological safety, building trust and EQ, I focus more on building relationships rather than ticking boxes. So I actually got feedback from my um, designers and asked them how I felt, how am I going, how can I do things better. So I've actually never felt bad because I asked them feedback because to me it's a 360 relationship. It's I don't believe it's top down. Um, I need to make sure I'm serving them. So that's why I also am inspired by Simon Sinek because he firmly believes in servant leadership. So I believe I'm serving my designers. Next question. As a shy person, how did I approach networking? Um, I think you saw the evidence there. I just went. <laughs> I just went to the networks, to the UX meetups. Um, I did ease myself into it by bringing one friend. And then I went, okay, well, the whole point of networking is to meet new people. So if I'm glued to that one friend, I'm not going to meet new people. So the next one, I just committed to going by myself. I wore my name tag. Um, I remembered my body language. I used eye contact. I looked around the room. If anyone smiled back at me, I just went straight up to them and said, oh, hi, how are you? Um, quite nervously, but then you realize they're in the same boat going, oh my God, is anyone going to speak to me? So what you realize is other people are looking to connect as well. So only when you finally do it, you realize everyone's in a similar boat. Next question. How 
How can you develop confidence in a work environment that is not welcoming to people in the inner circle speaking up? See, that's a difficult one. There's there's a few ways you can go around it because I think developing relationships is very important. There's always a solution. Sometimes it's hard when it's a toxic environment. If there is an inner circle, then that's probably just the work culture, but there are ways to break into that inner circle. Um, I won't mention the corporate environment I was in, but I was very much on the outer because I was a freelancer and they made it very clear I was on the outer. Um, But in terms of how I broke into that inner circle, I just worked hard. I gained their trust. I developed because I saw, I've actually tried to find out what they value And what they valued was someone who just works hard, has a really high level of design, has really strong stakeholder relationships. So when they saw that I was, you know, being cherry-picked for design projects with the head of China, they respected my presence and they slowly let me in. So in a way you can sort sort of like, you know, survivor. You kind of, you know, use your social skills, you find out what they value and then if they resonate with um, what you're contributing to, they'll kind of let you in. But then if they're not letting you in, guess what? You can also form your own circle, but we also don't want to be exclusive as well. So in that way, I sort of form my own circles but also widen it so I'm inclusive to everyone, including that inner circle. Okay, what are my presentation dog rituals, especially to overcome the nervous feeling? Um, So I may have mentioned I go through a feeling of stress. This is just my, I think my dad was a very highly strung person. Oh, two minutes to go. Um, And just stress growing up, it taught me that this is an important event. And so I usually feel all my stress, let it out, breathe it out. I kind of prepare my environment. I've got my light here, my talk notes. Um, I make sure I join early. I've practiced my talk more than several times. I've gotten feedback. I've made sure I've joined at the right time. I kind of make sure I'm over-prepared. And then I kind of relax make sure I kind of have the right energy because I want to make sure it's really fulfilling for the people joining. And I just try to give everything to whatever talk I'm presenting. That's my ritual. Okay, in terms of mentors, how important do you feel it is that they have a similar background? I don't think it's that important, actually, because I've actually mentored um, people who are analysts, um, come from finance, and they're interested in a finance journey. So for me, as long as they resonate with um, having a growth mindset, that's something I can teach. Um, If they um, are interested in problem solving or confidence building or how to communicate, these are pretty broad topics, so I don't necessarily need to um, specifically mentor designers. Like mentoring, you can teach very broad skills as long as it's relevant to that person. I think that was the last question. Yes, okay. Utkash, did you want to wrap up? Thanks a lot, Ermi, and thanks a lot, everyone, for being a part of it. And although Ermi did not mention it in the session, but she's not actually well today, but she's (laughs) still here making time for the session and helping us all out. Thanks a lot, Ermi, and see you guys in the next ones. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the love. Bye.